drew inspiration from 80s horror icons, um, among, of other, uh, among other things. But, um, yeah, just that idea that no matter how slow they walk, they always catch up with Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, the likes of Michael Myers, uh, Jason Verez, characters who don't necessarily say an awful lot, but they just do it through the physicality. It's this idea of inevitability that I, I kind of find scary. You know, you, you, it's it's similar similar with Eamon. It's like, you're gonna have to engage with this kid. He's coming down the line for you. And you're either with him or you're against him. For me, it was um, other characters in the show. I kind of looked at all the people that Baylor had been raised by and chose which bits of them I liked the most to put into her personality. And I, a person I spent a lot of time thinking about was Rainice, the person that she spent most of her time with and trying to like find glimpses of what Lena would have maybe grown into if she'd had the chance. Dr. Orna Grolnick from uh, the show Couples Therapy, I don't know if you know that, was a big influence because she's just, um, her quality of listening is, is extraordinary and she's just very, very um, laser focused and a very active listener. And I, I really like that quality, so I tried to sort of incorporate Maybe unsuccessfully, I don't know. But I tried to bring something of that into Laris. For season two, it's interesting, actually, because when you watch season one, obviously watching young Rhaenyra Millie Alcock, fantastic actress, and, uh, you know, when you actually watch them as a young self, you know, you see Rhaenyra when she was younger, she was a little bit, um, what's the word, crafty, a little bit sneaky, mm. um, not really listening to her father, you know, and you kind of see that with Jace a little bit. Yeah. Um, so them sort of aspects, you sort of mm. you sort of get the same. I think when you when you get a part that you're excited about, when you go to the theatre, when you go to the cinema, when you read books, you kind of see evidence of them everywhere, mm. and you get really excited to like sort of magpie bits from other different performances, from different um, from from different sort of pieces of art, and you're like, oh, I'll have that, I'll have that, mm. and that's why it's so nice, it's so exciting when you get to step into a new character because you get a new perspective to see your life through a yeah. bit. Um, so just try and write everything down in a little notebook. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. You do, when you, when you take on a new role and you sort of invest as much as we both like to in, in our work, you do see them everywhere. Mm. Everything, you're sort of seeing it through their lens almost and yeah. trying to bridge that gap between you and them, for which both of us there is quite a, there is quite a, a, a gap, mm. um, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> to war then. One of my favourite memories from season one was the family banquet scene that we did. Yeah. Mainly because it was the only time we were ever together, really. Like all of us all was of in like us, the blacks yeah. and the greens. And it was I am right in saying this the last time. It was right? the last time. The last scene time we, did. we were all together. Yeah. Um before Sweetheart. Lovely Luke passed away. Yeah. It was the last time that we all had as a family. So that was a really nice scene. And it took ages to film. <laughs> so we did it for so long. Yeah. I'm actually going to say something different. That that was really nice. And mm. there's been loads of moments in season two, obviously. But I would say the first time, I'm going to give him a mention now, actually. The first time I met um, El, uh, Elliot Greenhall, who plays the series, mm. who, who played the series in the show. Um, I would say we, we did like a scene in the Red Keep in season one where we was in in, in the Red Keep uh, looking at weapons and everybody's looking at Luke and Jace is trying to comfort him and I remember just having so much fun with Elle that day because we were literally so stunned about the set and, mm. and the props and everything and it was both of our first times on in there. Obviously Elliot, uh, this was his sort of like first, you know, big, big thing and he was, I remember him just being like, and seeing his face is just priceless, it's great. Normally, in the first season, it was most of my scenes uh, that made it were just me and the wonderful Olivia Cook, which is, I'm not complaining, but it was nice to sort of expand a bit more and have a few more scenes with Olivia and everyone, like Fabian. To get to spend time with Fabian is just like great fun because we don't think we had any scenes together. So that was like joyous to see like Tom Glencarney working and Ewan Mitchell working in the flesh is just like so impressive. And I'm so excited for people to see what they do. There was a day where catering did a barbecue. That was a good day. <laughs> that was one of my favourite days. I don't know if I was there for that. No, maybe you weren't. Oh, was it this season? Yeah. Yeah, with Lonnie. Yeah. Oh, no, I wasn't there. That was a good day. Damn it. Yeah. And that doesn't give any spoilers, does it? No, not at all. I do. It would be spoiling, but I can't wait for people to see it. Um, all the moments, I mean, just working with the cast, it's, um, it's one of the best parts of the job. You know, it's, it's like picking up 
and where we left off in season two, it's like rejoining a family. Uh, you kind of left it where it was, and you're you're, you're back into it, and it's uh, everybody knows where they're at, and it's 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 brilliant to work with these guys. My uncle is a challenge I won't come. If he dares face me. In the first season, a show full of uh, morally compromised grey characters, I, I wanted to present a character who at this point in his life was just complete darkness. You know, his, his appearance lends to that, so I, so I wanted to lean into it as much as possible in those last three episodes. Only to contradict the, the audience's uh, expectations and that theory, at the end of the series, when you do see that, that face of regret, going into season two, you are going to see more moments like that. You're going to see a different shades to Aymond. We find him in a, in a sticky spot. You know, he has, he has a choice to make. He can either return to King's Landing and admit what he did was a mistake and uh, be at the hands of Rhaenyra's mercy, or he can return to King's Landing and, and own it, so to speak. He can, he, can, he can say it was intentional. There was a lot of evidence to support that it was. And so he, 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 can, he can claim the kill if he, if he so much wants to. And so he's got a choice to make in, in between season one and season two. And what he makes, the choice he does make, you'll have to, you'll have to see. Going, going from one to two, we see him sort of step into the shoes and kind of take it in his stride as much as he can. Mm -hmm. He wants to make an impact. Um, he's juggling all sorts of different uh, insecurities and uh, a bit of imposter syndrome going on mm -hmm. and he, he tries to cover that with this bravado of um, you know being authoritative and um, powerful when really you know he sits in his room and he racks his brains on how to be liked by people because mm -hmm. he's, he's never had this is the first time we've seen him with purpose and responsibility and then yeah he's, he's navigating how how, how he does how he does that effectively we first see Jace um, you know his last time he was um, he had a job to do um, he is on route to Winterfell um, and he has no idea about his little brother obviously because they went in separate paths mm -hmm. um, so it's quite interesting in this season to see the contrast to when he didn't know and um, when he does know um, and obviously Jace is going to go through an awful lot of grief this season as he was not only his brother but his best friend and as the older brother he feels like he has a job to protect Luke in a way and he feels like he hasn't done that job properly because in reality it was his idea and he said send us so I think he feels a lot of responsibility for that as well. She's shattered by it, um, you know, beloved, beloved grandchild and she is typically for her uh, holding all of that together and holding herself together, holding everybody else around her together who's all off having, everyone's having nervous breakdowns in every corner and uh, unravelling before her eyes and she's just sucking it up, holding the fort and, and she's also physically, practically getting on with life and getting on with, with business and off on her dragon, actually doing some work while everyone else is sort of <laughs> collapsing in heaps. Laughing. Yeah, so we can expect a lot from Bailey this season. We find her in a place at the start of the season where she's just lost somebody again who she cares about so much and we find her really stepping up into herself as a member of the Black Council and as somebody who really wants to be loyal to Rhaenyra and to the Blacks and to her family. And we see her just trying to protect everybody that she loves, this one included. Um, and we see her really like making peace with who she is as a person and growing into the dragon rider she always was. Paulus, uh, when we find him, he's bruised and battered and unrecognisable to himself. Actually, that's the first two lines of a song called Philadelphia by Bruce Springsteen. But it just, <laughs> but it works, as I was saying it. But it works. But I think that's what it is. He's, he's grieving, he's broken, um, and his ship is broken. And he's trying to recover, trying to get over these, these deaths. And also then um, trying to salvage what is uh, this very special relationship he has with his wife. I think that this season... Helena is really coming to terms with what it means what to sort of dedicate your life to what's convenient for your family and the sacrifices that are made by uh, life 
in service to something greater than you, when actually sometimes I think some people should just live for themselves. In season one, you get a sense that he has a lot of influence and a lot of, um, a lot of it is his plans just sort of uh, fell into place and it's sort of left up to you, the audience, to sort of backtrack and figure out why and it's not particularly answered. But in season two, I was so excited because he, he, he's losing his influence. People's power uh, slipping. The people who are powerful at the beginning are less powerful as it goes on and the players keep changing and he is having to adapt and change with it. So he's really sort of constantly on the move and having to work. That change uh, was really exciting and it was really satisfying to play someone with obstacles, to play against challenges because that's when you can really see what a character's made of, is when they're coming up against uh, uh, barriers. This senseless war will send. Should not let us prevail. Not like this. Alison holds love for our enemy. That makes her a fool. Eamon believes that Aegon is um, inferior in a lot of ways. Um, he, he feels that he lacks the perseverance to be king. Whilst Aemond was in the Red Keep yard training with Kristen Cole, day in, day out, when he was studying with the Meisters, Aegon was in some sleazy corner in Flea Bottom, you know, squandering his inheritance. And so Aemond, he, he very much feels that he, can, he, he could do a better job, but he is loyal to his family. And that's also a redeeming quality of Aemond. He, he is loyal to his mother, he's loyal to his brother. And so it's, it's the duty of the second son to, to fight the war. He's the one who goes out on, on behalf of his older brother. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, that could be quite scary for people. Oh, it's a complex little thing, isn't it? The dynamic between yeah. Egon and Helena. They uh, are grown up with each other, so they know each other, but they also, in the same breath, don't at all because they're so different. Yeah. Um, they feel, to me anyway, like they're living in parallel universes but with a whole endless span of time between them. They're, yeah. they're never going to make that jump over. So they coexist and I think as new parents they have a, they have a, they have a common ground for mm -hmm. the first time ever. Uh, something that they share a love for. People can be in relationships and not really like each other. You know what I mean? They, you know, they can love each other but not but I think that these two love each other and like each other. I think they mm. like to be around each other. Mm. And I think that's what's one of the things that's so attractive about them. Mm. Because I think it's a kind of, someone said to me the other day that they are a, a relationship goal. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I, quite, I feel that. I, yeah. I look at them and I think, gosh, I'd love to you have know, that. that. That's a very, very healthy and, mm. and mature relationship. I think partly, well, they talk to each other. They um, massively respect each other. They're uh, both very equal, equally balanced in terms of sort of power and, and uh, autonomous strength. They both know each other very well and know themselves very well. Jason and Bela did grow up together and we, we met them very briefly when they were younger and we saw a kind of little glimpse into the relationship they had and they've always been very, very close and very dependent on each other. But I think for the first time in season two, we get to see them at a place where they're being completely honest with each other and they're really settling into their relationship. And we joke about it all the time that they've got like one of the steadiest relationships in Westeros, but we think that they have. And they, you know, they've really taken on board this betrothal and it's something they would have chosen for themselves even without being asked to. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we get to see Jason Baylor mature an awful lot this season. Um, literally right on before your very eyes on screen. So it's interesting to see how both of their sort of awful losses mm. have changed them as people um, and not only changed them but also changed their actions and their thinking towards life as well. 